North Korea is a land shrouded in secrecy. It is a country where information is tightly controlled and the outside world catches only glimpses of life inside its borders. What we do know paints a bleak picture, a nation grappling with poverty, oppression, and a totalitarian regime. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as it is officially known, is ruled with an iron fist by Kim Jong-un, the third generation of his family to hold absolute power. Beneath the propaganda and military parades lies a stark reality for ordinary North Koreans, one where basic necessities are scarce and fear is a constant companion. The world often hears of North Korea's nuclear ambitions and military displays. However, less well known is the plight of its people. Decades of economic mismanagement and a rigid adherence to a failed ideology have left the nation impoverished. Food shortages are chronic, and access to health care and education is limited for many. The state controls all aspects of life, from work assignments to the information citizens can access. Dissent is met with swift and brutal repression, ensuring obedience through fear. This is the reality for the vast majority of North Koreans, Yet, hidden from view, an elite few live in a bubble of luxury and privilege. Kim Jong-un, like his father and grandfather before him, maintains a lavish lifestyle, indulging in expensive tastes while his people struggle to survive. One of the most unsettling aspects of this disparity is the existence of Kim Jong-un's Pleasure Squad, a group of young women forced into sexual servitude for the dictator and his inner circle. This essay will delve into the dark underbelly of North Korea's elite, exposing the stark contrast between their opulence and the poverty endured by millions. The existence of Kim Jong-un's pleasure squad, while shocking to some, is not a new phenomenon in North Korea. This practice, steeped in secrecy and exploitation, has persisted through three generations of the Kim dynasty. Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea, established the first iteration of the pleasure squad, known as the Kipomjo, these women, some as young as teenagers, were forcibly recruited from schools and workplaces, their families powerless to intervene. The Kipumjo served as a harem for Kim Il-sung, catering to his every whim. Some were tasked with providing sexual services, while others were trained as dancers, singers, and masseuses. Escape was unthinkable, and disobedience carried dire consequences. The system, shrouded in secrecy, became a chilling symbol of the regime's absolute power and disregard for human rights. When Kim Jong-il inherited power from his father, he continued the Pleasure Squad tradition, renaming it the Chongshin Dai. Under his rule, the methods of recruitment became more sophisticated, with agents scouring the country for attractive and talented young women. Families, often coerced with promises of rewards or threats of punishment, were forced to surrender their daughters to this system. The Chongshin Dai served as a source of entertainment and prestige for Kim Jong-il and his high-ranking officials. The women, often kept isolated and under constant surveillance, endured a life devoid of freedom or autonomy. Their stories, rarely told due to the risks involved, offer a glimpse into a dark and disturbing aspect of North Korea's ruling elite. While the majority of North Koreans struggled to afford basic necessities, the country's elite, headed by Kim Jong-un, indulges in a lavish lifestyle that would be the envy of many dictators. High-end goods flow into the country, bypassing international sanctions, to satisfy the expensive tastes of the ruling class. Kim Jong-un, known for his love of luxury cars, fine liquor and gourmet food, spares no expense in maintaining his opulent lifestyle. Department stores catering exclusively to the elite, stocked with designer clothing, imported delicacies and top-shelf electronics, stand in stark contrast to the empty shelves found in stores accessible to ordinary citizens. The Donju, a newly affluent class that has profited from North Korea's burgeoning informal markets, also partake in this culture of conspicuous consumption. Their displays of wealth, while distasteful in the face of widespread poverty, serve as a reminder of the growing disparity in North Korean society. The extravagance of Kim Jong-un and his inner circle extends beyond material possessions. Luxury villas, private resorts, and exclusive entertainment venues are just some of the perks enjoyed by those in power. The cost of maintaining this lavish lifestyle, while difficult to quantify, represents a significant drain on North Korea's already strained economy. It is a stark reminder of the regime's skewed priorities, where the comfort and indulgence of the few take precedence over the basic needs of the many. 
The secretive nature of Kim Jong-un's pleasure squad makes it difficult to obtain accurate information about its inner workings. However, rare accounts from defectors and those who have managed to escape North Korea offer chilling glimpses into this world. One such account comes from me, Lee L. N., the nephew of Kim Jong-il. I defected from North Korea in the late 1990s. My privileged position gave me unique access to the inner circles of power, including glimpses into the operations of the Pleasure Squad. According to what I saw, young women recruited into the Pleasure Squad, now known as the Gajibawi, undergo rigorous training and indoctrination. They are taught to cater to the whims of the elite, instructed in everything from music and dance to massage and sexual techniques. Their lives are tightly controlled, their movements monitored, and their communication with the outside world strictly forbidden. Leal N's accounts, while disturbing, offer valuable insights into the exploitation and abuse inherent in the Pleasure Squad system. He describes a culture of fear and obedience where the women are treated as objects, their voices silenced, and their lives completely controlled by the regime. My testimony serves as a stark reminder of the human cost of the Kim Dynasty's excesses. The Pleasure Squad was not just about providing entertainment. It was a means to control and manipulate us. We were selected based on our looks, our talents, and our loyalty to the regime. The regime's use of the Pleasure Squad extends beyond mere entertainment. It serves as a powerful tool to maintain control over the elite, ensuring their loyalty through indulgence and fear. Many of us were taken from our families at a young age, trained rigorously and kept in isolation. We were told that this was an honor, but it felt more like a prison. The psychological impact on the members is profound. Isolated from their families and brainwashed into believing their service is an honor, they become pawns in the regime's game of power. We were constantly monitored, and any sign of disobedience was met with severe punishment. The fear of repercussions kept us in line. This fear of punishment ensures compliance, making the Pleasure Squad an effective instrument of control within the regime's broader strategy of maintaining power. It's a life of luxury on the surface, but underneath, it's a life of constant surveillance and fear. The facade of luxury hides a reality of oppression, showcasing the lengths to which the regime will go to maintain its grip on power. North Korea's economy has been in a steady decline for decades. The regime's focus on military spending and nuclear development has drained resources from essential sectors like agriculture and healthcare. Yeah, and this misallocation of resources has led to widespread poverty and chronic food shortages. The regime's isolationist policies have only exacerbated these issues, cutting off the country from international aid and trade. The economic hardships are felt most acutely by ordinary citizens, who struggle to meet their basic needs while the regime continues to prioritize its military ambitions. It's a tragic situation, really. The people of North Korea are paying the price for the regime's relentless pursuit of power. The signs of economic distress are everywhere. Public infrastructure is crumbling and many people are forced to rely on informal markets just to survive. Absolutely. These informal markets, known as Jiang Madang, have become a lifeline for many North Koreans. But they also highlight the regime's failure to provide for its people. And you know, public discontent is growing. There are reports of increasing dissent and even small-scale protests which are almost unheard of in North Korea. Yeah, it's a clear indication that the people are reaching a breaking point. The regime's grip on power is being tested like never before. The rise of the Yang Madang represents a glimmer of hope for North Koreans. These markets have not only provided a means of survival, but also a space for social interaction and the exchange of ideas. That's right. The Jang Madang have become a symbol of resilience and ingenuity. They show that despite the regime's oppressive control, the North Korean people are finding ways to adapt and thrive. And, you know, there is potential for change. The Jiang Madang could pave the way for a more open and dynamic economy, challenging the regime's monopoly on power. It's an intriguing possibility. The resilience of the North Korean people could be the catalyst for a brighter future. The contrast between the elite and the ordinary citizens in North Korea is stark. While the elite enjoy luxurious lifestyles, the majority of the population lives in poverty. Yeah, it's a shocking disparity. The regime's leaders have access to the finest goods and services, while the average North Korean struggles to find enough food to eat. The regime justifies this by claiming that the elite's prosperity is necessary for the country's stability and security. But of course, this only serves to deepen the divide and fuel resentment among the people. It's a disturbing reality. The elite's opulence stands in stark contrast to the suffering of the ordinary citizens. 
highlighting the regime's brutal inequality.